The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 11127 in the name of Daniel Johnson on the portrayal of ADHD treatment. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Daniel Johnson to open the debate for around seven minutes. Please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the few months since I first confirmed to Parliament that I had ADHD, I've, I've been touched and, and slightly overwhelmed by the number of people who have told me, first of all, thank you for speaking up, but also to comment on what they perceive as my courage and bravery in speaking up. I have to say, I feel slightly guilty because I'm not sure I was brave at all. You see, the thing about having ADHD is you have very poor impulse control. And I have to say, I just got very angry about the press coverage of ADHD, and I felt I had to speak up. And I have to say, I quite often find myself, when I find myself looking at something I think is unfair or unjust, I quite often speak before I've thought about whether it's sensible or not to do so. But I have to say, I think that's probably quite a good thing for an MSP, and I'll, I'll touch on, on that later on. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, I've got angry again, because Netflix released a documentary called Take Your Pills just a, a, a month or so ago. And it's a sensationalist documentary. It, 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 it explores a, a, a trope around there being an explosion of diagnosis of ADHD, that the medication is unnecessary, and it compares ADHD medication to crystal meth. It peddles and perpetuates myths that those of us with ADHD battle against almost on a daily basis, that ADHD isn't real, and that the meds do more harm than goods, uh, and also that, that doctors are handing out pills like sweeties. Now, as part of speaking up, writing articles, and speaking at events that I've done since speaking out in Parliament, I've told my story about how ADHD and the diagnosis has been empowering, how it's transformed my life and how medication has been a vital first step within that. But the thing is, I'm not alone. It, this isn't a rare condition. One in 20 people are like me. Everyone in here will know other people with ADHD, whether it's friends or in classrooms, there'll be at least two or three children with ADHD. So the fact that this is such a prevalent condition but there's so little understanding. The fact that people will know more about the myths regarding ADHD rather than the facts just isn't right. The very fact that this is, I think, the first time ADHD has been debated as a topic on its own in this parliament, I think, isn't right. So that is what we are here to do today, to bust the myths surrounding ADHD and to build the understanding that I think we need. So let's start with the facts. I have ADHD and I've been taking uh, methylphenidate, which most people will know is Ritalin, every day for the last five years. So that's the fact. Let's deal with the fiction. I'm not a victim. I'm not looking for special treatment. My brain is just wired up in a slightly different way. The things that most people find easy, mundane, routine, people like me find incredibly difficult. I'm not constantly running around, bouncing off the walls like a naughty child. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is just that. It is a composite of different traits. Part of it is about inattentiveness. So it's as much about that daydreamy child at the back of the classroom who isn't concentrating at all as it is about the naughty child running around. And I'm much more on the inattentive side of the spectrum rather than the hyperactive side. I'm not making it up. And I feel pain that I have to say that. But ADHD is real. It's not an excuse for bad parenting. It's not something that I'm seeking special treatment for. It's not a social phenomenon. If you scanned my brain, my prefrontal cortex just isn't as active as most people's. My brain doesn't produce enough dopamine. There are genetic markers which are highly uh, predictive of ADHD. And finally, I take ADHD medication, but I am not a zombie. The myth that somehow by giving people ADHD medication, they get turned into incommunicative uh, uh, zombies is just false. ADHD medication, in the most part, is stimulant-based. It is the complete opposite of a sedative. Now, if that sounds strange, let me just put it to you like this. How many people in this chamber, before they start work the day, have a cup of coffee? Or when they sit down to write a speech, drink a cup of tea? We take stimulants because it's a way of helping our brains deal with mundane and slightly banal chores. It's about keeping our brain interested in what we have at hand. And that's especially important and especially true of ADHD medication. And it's also why it's so important as a first step 
as a first step to learning the skills, to learning the techniques that you need to deal with the condition on top of the pills. Because without taking the pills, you can't do that. So many people ask me, what is it like to have ADHD? What, what goes on in your head? And the best way I've got of explaining it is, it's a bit like a record player. But your needle keeps jumping out of the groove. So you know what track you want to play, but the needle just won't stay in there. And medication is the first step you need to do to keeping the needle in the groove. But there's another way of looking at that record analogy. So people with ADHD don't just look at an individual track at a time. They like looking at the whole album. People with ADHD view the world in macro, not micro. We like looking at the big picture. We see the connections. We <coughs> are constantly finding tangents and different ways of looking at things. And that allows us to see things that other people don't. And again, I spoke at the beginning that being slightly inhibited about speaking up is useful for being a, an MSP. But I think seeing that bigger picture and those connections is vital for my work. And I think allows me to bring something else to this job. But let me say one other thing about being a, a politician. And 5% of people have ADHD. So there will be other people. And I just hope that this debate gives other politicians the courage to either maybe get a diagnosis or if they have one, speak up about it. But let me say one other thing about that 5%. Well, 5% of the population have ADHD. And the prison population is 20%. Now, I just want people to think about that. That's four times higher. So what is going on? And I think, at the very least, it points to a failure, a social failure, a failure of all of our understanding, but also a policy failure. For, some, for, for people to end up in that situation, for such a high prevalence, something is not right. But because there is one brutal and blunt fact is that while the myth is that we overdiagnose ADHD, nothing could be further from the truth. We underdiagnose this condition. 1% of the adult population have an ADHD diagnosis. The proportion is very similar for the child population. That is a massive underdiagnosis of this condition and an undermedication of this condition. And the, the myths that get peddled stop people from seeking the help and getting that first step, that vital first step which medication provides that they need to deal with their condition and the consequences that it has. Medication, in the words of NICE, is a first-line therapy. And I think that's what needs to be borne in mind. So as I close, presiding officer, we need to destigmatize medication. We need better access to mental health services. And we need more than just medication. It's about pills and skills. Now, if there was one positive outcome to the very negative, uh, I think, effect that the Netflix documentary had was this, is that people took to social media, people like me, to speak up about the positive impact that pills had taken on their, had on their life, about what it had enabled them to do. And if you look up the hashtag, I take my pills because, you will see those testimonies and the positive experiences that people have. And it outtrended the hashtag for the documentary itself. So let me just say this. I take my pills because they enable me to function. They free up my head to develop the skills and learn to cope with my condition. But for, most importantly, I take my pills because they have transformed my life and they've transformed the life of my family. Thank you. Move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please. Emma Harper to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer, um, and thank you, Daniel Johnson, for bringing this important issue to the attention of Parliament today. I watched the Take Your Pills documentary, and I felt much the same way others have felt when they described it. One reviewer called it aggravatingly myopic and scaremongering. I refer members to my register of interest that I'm a nurse, and I should also mention that I have had many years' first-hand experience of living with someone with ADHD. My husband has ADHD and he was diagnosed as an adult when he was 35 years old in Los Angeles. The diagnosis was life-changing for him. He'd been on the psychostimulant medication Adderall for his ADHD for almost two, year, two years when we met and I saw no symptoms of any kind and I had no idea he had ADHD until he told me. Adderall worked for him. It helped him focus, it helped him pro uh, with project completion, and it helped promote positive relationships with everyone. My husband describes his ADHD like, imagine you're sitting in a room trying to read a book, and there's three televisions on, all in different channels, and there's two stereos in the room playing different songs. 
And there are also three groups of people standing around you carrying on three different conversations. He says, this is what it's like. This is what he, how he described what he feels like inside his head when reading a book. But when he takes Adderall, there's only one TV on and one stereo playing. So it's much easier for him to focus on what he's reading. I'm aware that ADHD is caused by a variety of environmental and genetic factors, and it's usually a hereditary condition. And ADHD usually becomes apparent before the age of 12. But many people, like my husband, are not diagnosed until adulthood. It is estimated that around 5% of school-aged children have ADHD globally, and that about 4% of the adult population have ADHD. In Scotland, only 0.08% of adult population, eight out of 10,000, are receiving medication for their ADHD. I suspect there are a lot more adults out there, like my husband, who know medication would help them and would like to receive medication, but they are currently not. He went to his GP 13 years ago after we returned to Scotland and he was informed that ADHD in adults was not high on the agenda. That was in 2005. So now in 2018, I've encouraged him to go to his current GP and try again. And hopefully he will get a more satisfactory result. The motion notes that the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines, um, the Sign Guidelines Network for the Management of ADHD in Children and Young People, sign number 112, has not been updated since 2009. In fact, at the bottom of the sign 112, the web page, it says, this guideline was issued in 2009 and will be considered for review in three years. Use with caution, declaration of interest governance may not be in line with current policy. The web page itself warns that it is out of date. I would like to urge the Scottish Government to encourage Healthcare Improvement Scotland to update sign number 112, management of ADHD in children and young people as a matter of urgency. I would also encourage them to include adult ADHD in the guideline. Presiding officer, in closing, let me thank the Scottish ADHD Coalition and their work and their excellent website. It is full of helpful factual information. I note that there are 15 ADHD support groups across Scotland and only three of them are for adults with ADHD. I was also perturbed to see that there are no groups south of the Central Belt in my South Scotland region. No group in Dumfries, none in Ayr, none in Stranraer. I'd like to see that change. I also discovered a terrific YouTube channel called How to ADHD, which is created by Jessica McCabe in the USA. She has excellent information in her videos and enc I encourage everyone, professionals as well as folks with ADHD and family members to check it out. Thank you very much. Miles Briggs, followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating Daniel Johnson on securing today's debate and pay tribute to the work he has done speaking out about his own personal experience of ADH, ADHD and raising awareness of these issues. I think it's important we have these debates in Parliament and when members bring their personal interest and personal experience, it makes, um, I think, for excellent debates. I completely agree with Daniel Johnson that we need to see media, especially documentary programmes, provide a balanced and informed portrayal of ADHD and how it's treated. And I believe today's debate is therefore timely and extremely important. I also thank, as uh, Emma Harper has, the Scottish ADHD Coalition for their useful briefing ahead of today's debate. And I commend them for all they do on behalf of children and families across Scotland. The coalition's establishment in 2017 to bring together all of the voluntary organisations providing support to families was a very positive step forward, I think. ADHD is a significant health issue for our society. It's estimated that, as has been said, 5% of children have ADHD and approximately 1.5% have severe ADHD uh, disorder. And there's also a large number of adults, as already been mentioned, who've never received any diagnosis. And I know last year Daniel Johnson was concerned at some of the comments um, which I had made in relation to the start sharp increase in drugs such as Ritalin being prescribed to children with ADHD. And I want to make very clear, as um, we have spoken about in the past as well, that we recognise that such med medication can make a huge difference to many children and indeed adults. And this is a positive thing which we should all support. Absolutely no one should feel in any way that there's anything wrong with taking such medication any more than they would take a medication for a physical illness. But each individual is different, and medication alone will often not be the only single answer. 
And in many concerns, which I wanted to highlight, was the suggestion that in many cases, uh, medication was all that was being offered and other treatments and support systems like parental training, uh, school interventions, counselling and psychological support were simply not being avail made available to families across Scotland. And we continue to see uh, that being the case. Sign makes clear that for mild symptoms of ADHD, clinicians should also consider behavioural approaches in the first instance. And concern about medication-only approach is a key finding from the Attending to Parents report published uh, by the Scottish ADHD Coalition, which also noted that the parents who refuse medication for their children are often discharged from services in Scotland, something which all of us, I think, will find unacceptable and has to change. We also need to ensure that for each patient and individual, the continuing benefit from a need for medication should be assessed at least once a year by the sign recommendations. The Coalition's report also highlights concern about excessively long CAMS waiting time, something that all of us in this chamber have raised and expressed concerns about. The continuing source of angu anguish for many people in my own region of Lothian and I know across Scotland. And it's also calling for teachers to receive much greater training on ADHD, and I support this. I think it's really vital. I've recently, re recently received a copy of a letter from my Perth and Kinross councillor colleague, councillor Chrissa Hearn, who's written to the Cabinet Secretary for Health about ADHD. Councillor Hearn makes a number of important points and emphasises that there, there is in Scotland a real lack of reliable data sets on ADHD and its impact in schools and the workplace and as Daniel Johnston has already highlighted in prisons, it was one part of the Health and Sport Committee's work which we didn't really touch on um, but did highlight when we were looking at prisoner health and opportunities and I think it's something um, which we really need to continue to, to look at in terms of the mental health and, and also head trauma which was highlighted quite significantly in the work we did and what's and prisoner populations not actually having access to any assessment and um, to look at these sorts of aspects of their health um, councillor Hearn be believes that the Scottish Government should address this and also consider setting up a cross-party working group to look at the diagnosis and treatment of ADHD and perhaps the Minister can respond to these points in her closing speech and something members across the Chamber will also want to look to take forward. In concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again welcome uh, today's debate and the fact that Daniel Johnson has brought this subject forward for today's debate and the way in which he's done that. In light of the new NICE and Royal College of um, Psychiatrists in Scotland guidelines I'm very sympathetic to the view that our sign guidelines guidelines now should also be updated to ensure that people of all ages with ADHD in Scotland and their families know what type and level of care they should be receiving thank you Anna Sarwar to be followed by Stuart Stevenson thank you Deputy Spreading Officer and can I like others start by congratulating Daniel Johnson for bringing forward this important debate now Mr Johnson was extremely modest in his uh, opening contribution uh, when he said there was no such thing as his bravery and courage in speaking out. Um, I can say to him as a friend, he's not often doing modesty, so he shouldn't do modesty uh, on this. <laughs> it is extremely brave and courageous of him uh, to speak out, particularly around his own circumstances. Um, and as someone who knows him as um, a friend, as a colleague, and who's seen him as a parent, um, he is a first-class human being in all three of those aspects. A fantastic and diligent member of parliament, not an ineffective or hyperactive one. Um, a first class parent um, and always a pleasure and a joy um, to be around. So um, not only has he brought forward this important debate, um, he's done so in a manner to actually affect change by speaking about his own circumstances. And I also hope um, it's been done to try and give confidence to other people to speak out, not just confidence in terms of parliamentarians or other people involved in politics but actually I hope confidence to the wider public um, to seek access to services to speak openly about their own circumstances with their friends with their families with their loved ones but also with the healthcare professionals um, and I hope we can send a unified message um, against what was portrayed in that Netflix documentary and instead open a positive dialogue about what positive treatment we can have um, going forward and on that basis I want to focus on um, one, a few areas one, one area in particular is around the destigmatization um, of ADHD um, it's no different to any other um, physical or mental condition there is no shame in having ADHD there is no shame in taking your medication or your pills whether that be for ADHD or any other condition and we should be very very clear um, about that 
But it's also important to recognise that while people have neurodevelopment conditions like ADHD, the services that they will access will be mental health services. And the pressures that we see in our mental health services, whether that be around CAMS or indeed adult services, will therefore impact on patients and families affected by ADHD uh, too. So how we have an effective CAM system and mental health system, I think is extremely, extremely important. If we look at the experiences of parents, 80% of parents that were surveyed said that they felt it took too long for their child to be diagnosed with ADHD. That can't be good enough. We need to look into how we have quicker diagnosis. And we've got to recognize the huge variation that there is in terms of access to courses of treatment Mr. Johnson referred to 5% of the population um, having ADHD, 20% of the prison population. If you actually look at the treatment rates, uh, it's about a 1% uh, average across the country. It varies so much that it's uh, much, much higher. For example, 2% of the population aged between 5 to 19 taking ADHD medication um, in the borders. That complains to, com compares to only just 0.4% um, in Lanarkshire. And that shows you a huge variation in how ADHD is diagnosed and treated in different parts of the country. I think that needs to be addressed in a much more um, serious and open way. Um, and just in, in closing, Deputy President Officer, around, um, we've had conversation, Mr Briggs mentioned around pills, Mr Johnson mentioned around pills. I think it's important to end the stigma around people using medication. But let's be very clear that the reason why counselling and support services are so important, particularly in our schools, so access to services within our schools and then access to services in primary care and in community care is not just so we medicate individuals, but actually empower individuals to be able to take, make interventions in their own life that will help them to deal better with ADHD and therefore have a positive impact, not just on their own life circumstances, but on the life circumstances of their work colleagues, it could be, it could be of their friends, it could be of their family, and it could indeed be of their children. So what I hope comes out of this debate today is a more open and honest conversation about ADHD, a challenging of the stigma of ADHD and the use of pills when it comes to ADHD, an improving of diagnosis for ADHD, an improving of the referral pathway for ADHD, and looking at a more holistic approach so it's something that is recognised as a genuine condition alongside other conditions and that people feel they have someone to turn to and that they will not be written off by society. And once again, I thank Daniel Johnson for bringing forward this important debate. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And like others, let me uh, both thank uh, Daniel Johnson for giving the opportunity to have this debate, but also congratulate him on the very individual and particular contribution he is able to make and uh, the real courage it takes to make it. Uh, fortunately, I'm not in a position where I have to exercise uh, that kind of choice. Members, uh, some members here may have heard me previously uh, talk about the first job I had when I left school. For about eight months, I worked in a psychiatric hospital in a locked ward in 1964, just at the point where the very first medications were becoming available that would uh, enable people with quite a wide range of psychiatric and uh, other conditions uh, to get something better than simply being locked up in the old asylum. The asylum in which I worked had about 1,200 patients. Today, the hospital that sits on that uh, site has around 100 patients. So my starting point is that medication is an important part of dealing with a wide range of conditions, ACHD, ADHD uh, being uh, one of them. However, I think I, uh, like others, uh, uh, thank the, uh, the coalition for their contribution at the debate and the briefing, and they talk about uh, a survey they did uh, of parents, um, and they refer to medication, parent training, school interventions, and psychological support. And I haven't, I must confess, uh, watched the Netflix film. I take Daniel Johnson's word for what's in it supplemented by what uh, uh, Emma Harper has said. Uh, but I did see uh, just a few weeks ago uh, on BBC4, the doctor who gave up on drugs, uh, 23rd of May, 2018, BBC4. And uh, it was interesting because he was using a mindfulness approach uh, to support uh, school uh, students who had uh, ADHD. 
not getting them off the drugs, but giving them a choice and giving them space. And I was quite impressed, but of course, television programs always short circuit complexities, and we need to be very careful about that. I'm not assuming that the magic bullet was contained in that uh, one hour of, of television. But I think it leads us to an important general point, and that is our use of the word and the concept of normal. I think we increasingly view normal as a much narrower range than it's proper to consider. Uh, I think normal is anything, uh, behaviors, aptitudes, abilities, conditions, that does not harm the individual or cause the individual to harm anyone else. We should review normal as covering a much wider range, a much wider uh, variety. I mean, I have my, my own phobias. I can't come into here without getting to my office. I'm generally first in on the fourth floor without straightening up all the rubbish bins. It's just something I feel uh, compelled to do. I, I virtually won't use the phone. I'm virtually phobic on that. And personally, I hate pills. But there is a reason for that, because I was in an experimental uh, drug program for a particular condition I had at the time when I was 12. And it didn't sort the condition, but it's left me with lifelong issues associated with that trial. So I personally use self-hypnosis to deal with pain and with my asthma. Uh, so I haven't taken medication for asthma now for 35 years. But I'm fortunate, I'm able to do that because my condition probably isn't severe enough to require medication. And isn't that to the heart of the whole thing? We have to treat people as individuals and find individual treatments that suit them. And it will be a mix of medications, perhaps, a mix of uh, psychological support, a mix of family and educational system support. And it's that diversity and that range of what is normal that we should perhaps think about when we think about this issue. Once again, um, Daniel Johnson deserves our thanks for raising it in this context and showing us that there is more to this, or perhaps less to this, than we might have otherwise thought. Presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I join members from across the chamber in congratulating Daniel Johnson for gaining cross-party support for his motion on the portrayal of ADHD treatment uh, and his incredibly personal and compelling opening speech. Now, most, if not all of us, will have met someone who has ADHD, and I'm also grateful for colleagues such as Emma Harper uh, for sharing their own experience of that. Uh, and for those of us who think we haven't met someone, we probably have, but just didn't realize it at the time. Because as with many health issues, the symptoms are not necessarily physical. And we've seen a move in recent years of treating mental health conditions differently to how we treat physical health conditions. But, but we must assess each and every condition individually in order to effectively help those in need. Now, those who know me know that I'm an avid rugby fan and a former player, and I'm sure that we're all very well aware of the benefits of physical exercise, no matter which sport may be of your choosing. And so it's been immensely rewarding to have coached a couple of young players with ADHD and seen their progress and improved participation both on and off the field. And it's been a great lesson for myself to have learned how to coach people with ADHD within a wider group. And physical exercise has been proven time and again to have a massive benefit on our mental health. Now, I'm not saying that picking up a rugby ball will treat ADHD definitively, but many studies have shown that playing a sport can help children and adults manage their ADHD. Now, because although SIGN and NICE guidelines recommend multimodal treatment for ADHD, including parent training, school interventions, and psychological support, in many areas, medication is all that is offered, and parents who refuse medication for their children are often discharged from services. Now, despite unhelpful programs such as Take Your Pills, medication is a valid option, but for many helps those with ADHD manage their symptoms to lead a better life. But for some time, it is the additional treatments, including psychological support, that are able to help. And so we must listen to those with ADHD and organizations such as the Scottish ADHD Coalition on what treatments make a real improvement to people's lives. Now, it's not just the health service, schools and individuals 
who can help improve the way we manage ADHD treatment. The business world needs to get involved too. And as The Guardian published in an article in March of this year, those with ADHD can be a huge asset to the workplace if they are supported. There were many stories on individual struggles in the workplace, but research has found that by utilizing the symptoms of ADHD, such as hyperfocusing, businesses can actually benefit from hiring people with ADHD. And every manager and employer knows that you should use the differing strengths of your employees, and it is no different for those with the ADHD. So I was pleased to read that the Scottish ADHD Coalition have published a guide for employers, which I look forward to sharing across my constituency and the wider business community. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, we are here today because more action is needed from the Scottish Government to bring forward plans to update NICE and SIGN guidelines. But I would also encourage them to ensure that all government departments are working to ensure that those with ADHD can enjoy all aspects of life with the support of those around them. Thank you. I now call Maureen Watt to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to, too, begin by commending Daniel Johnson for bringing this motion to the Chamber today. Mr Johnson has bravely shared his own experience... Excuse me, Miss, Miss Watt, could you...? Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Do you want me to start again, or shall I just continue? Thank you very much for bringing the, uh, this motion to debate this evening and for sharing your own experience of being diagnosed with ADHD um, on a previous occasion, and thank you very much for that. Mental health is something we all have, and by being open and, uh, about our own experiences of mental health issues and neurodevelopmental disorders, we can help to reduce stigma and promote understanding. And I think it's so important that we lead by example here. And I absolutely share your concern and others uh, that have mentioned the uh, as ADHD was shown on the documentary Take Your uh, Pills, which was distributed in the UK by Netflix. I did watch the programme, and I do think it's important to note that the film focuses on the US and should be vo viewed in that context. And I was very disappointed to see the condition portrayed in such an unbalanced and frankly stigmatising manner, which is not helpful for, for people living with the condition and those who are supporting them. Um, and before I proceed further, I'd also like to welcome the recent publication of the NICE guidelines on the diagnosis and management of ADHD and guidance published last m summer on the management of adult ADHD by the Scottish Division of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So accordingly, we will be looking to update the sign guidance on ADHD at the earliest opportunity, and I hope that will be welcomed by Emma Harper and others um, who have mentioned that. Members have also mentioned about the prescription of medication, which does get a lot of media attention at the moment, not just for ADHD, but for uh, depression um, and other uh, mental health conditions. And I absolutely understand that people have concerns about this and that we take time to address it. But I think it's also important to listen what, to what Daniel Johnson said and acknowledge that the treatment of ADHD in adults and children can be about medication, but it's not just about medication. And it's about making sure the right support is in place at the right time. And I'll go on to say a bit more later about what we're doing to support children and young people with ADHD. But let me make it absolutely clear. People experiencing mental ill health and those living with, uh, uh, with a neurodevelopmental disorder should expect the same standard of care as people with physical illness and should receive medication if they need it. And Stuart Stevenson's um, historical um, analogy was uh, important. I think we should reflect in this, the 70th year of the NHS, just how far we have come in uh, treating people with neurodevelopmental disorders and mental illness disorders, and that they're not still institutionalized as they were so unnecessarily uh, in times past. And of course, the prescription of any medication 
is a clinical decision made by health professionals in discussion with the patient. And we know that there's good evidence that health professionals do assess and treat these conditions um, appropriately. But of course, other, th um, other things can be used um, to help people with the condition. And it was interesting that Alexander Burnett mentioned the benefits of sport. Some of you may have been at the event that was in Parliament a few weeks ago called Tennis Aces, which showed that when children with neurodevelopmental disorders or, or indeed young adults or older people concentrate, and there's a similar project in the northeast of Scotland on the Murray course on golf, that the concentration required does give people relief of all the things that are going on in their heads. So all of these things are important and we must realise that medication is not the only treatment. And we are committed to improving access to alternatives such as psychological therapies that increase choice and best accommodate patient pre preference. And the Scottish Government supports services provided by Breathing Space and NHS Living Life to, pe to help people who are experiencing depression and more low mood for whatever reason. And that's a key element of wider work across Scotland to intervene early and prevent problems from becoming worse. And this aligns well with our policy on improving prevention and in early intervention, which is just one of the areas of focus of our new 10-year mental health strategy. So uh, on supporting children and young people who are living with ADHD, we're absolutely committed to giving uh, those children the opportunities to su succeed in school. And we're clear that pupil pupils should get the support that they need to reach their full learning potential. And it is, of course, up to education authorities to have in place appropriate policies and guidance to support all staff who work with children and young people with ADHD to ensure that they make the most of their learning opportunities. And to support staff in this, We've recently published the revised Supporter Learning Co Learners Code of Practice, which explains the duties on education authorities and other agencies. And we've also worked closely with Education Scotland to roll out mental health first aid training aimed at staff within secondary school communities. And this training seeks to increase their confidence in approaching pupils who they might think are struggling um, with a mental health uh, problem. And all these measures are designed to ensure that children and young people with ADHD are supported to reach their full potential free of stigma. Miles Briggs mentioned the, uh, the um, evidence session that you had on uh, prison uh, health. And as a former prison visitor, I'm very well aware of the number of people in prison who not only have ADHD, but other behavioural issues, and quite frankly, should not be uh, part of the prison population. So I want to thank Daniel Johnson for bringing this motion to the chamber this afternoon. He didn't mention that he's written to me um, to um, have a round table, uh, which I'm absolutely up for, and I look forward to us working together on that, that we have it early in the next session, um, rather, then later, and I think that that will contribute to what Anna Sarwar asked for, which was more openness on this uh, subject. So thank you very much. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is closed. <laughs>